Jackson Stuker, it's a pleasure to have you here. The, the occasion of this call concerns the, the life and legacy of Carl Hess. We recently bumped into five videos of, that he, of, of, of lectures that he gave in his last years of his life. Really might have been the last year, last uh, couple of years. And in the course of these lectures, he gives a kind of overview of his own worldview. He's a hugely important figure in 20th century uh, libertarianism, really. Uh, just a, a kind of a giant. I have some sense that he's not as well known as, as he, he might be. Um, what's your sense of that, Jackson? Carl has definitely has faded into obscurity, and it's a very strange thing because he, of all people, especially in the late 60s, early 70s, was just a very public figure in libertarianism and left-wing politics and right-wing politics, which is rare. Um, to give the uninitiated sort of a, an overview of who Carl Hess was, he started out in the 50s and 60s, kind of rose to prominence as a, a top advisor and a speechwriter for a lot of the big Republicans like Barry Goldwater. And when Goldwater lost the election uh, for the presidency in 64, he, uh, he kind of put himself into a political exile. And um, so Carl Hess reemerged years later, uh, getting arrested at these student demonstrations that were typical of the, the 70s. Uh, he was involved with the Black Panthers. He was a welder, a tax resistor, and this was kind of a shock to the system. So, um, in a lot of ways, you can describe him as one of the last great American radicals in that he had this, this prominence and then he sort of vanished and came back very radical. You know, I know that in later years he dabbled in the LP, but but he was sort of the, the ultimate anti-political figure. In fact, he seemed to have learned the lesson about politics much earlier than everybody else. He, he wrote an article, a very famous article, what year was it, 1968 or something, called The End of Politics. Yeah. And that was published in Playboy, to give you an idea. It wasn't just uh, the Libertarian Forum, which he did edit uh, in the 60s and 70s, but this was Playboy. Um, this was something that people read. He wrote for uh, Ramparts, sort of the big countercultural ma magazine. And it's kind of... I don't think you see that much anymore. You don't see these big Libertarian figures in this much of a spotlight. He was very much a sort of an icon or a figure of the counterculture, just as much as he was Libertarians, too. He was very much uh, a man of his time and a man ahead of his time. Yeah, I've had the sense of that. He uh, was thinking about things that are only being sort of <clears throat> explored now by by younger libertarian um, activists and thinkers about actually applications of liberty in your own in your own life, giving up on the political system and and turning towards uh, making making freedom of value that, uh, through your own choices, your own decisions. That's something Carl Hess was doing very very early on. Uh, do you have any any uh, sense of how his life with Goldwater sort of affected his his outlook? What what was it that turned him away from uh, from from politics and and I guess you could say right wing ideology? I'm not sure that he was ever really a right wing. Uh, it's, right when you or not. It's funny that you say that because I, it's tough to d characterize him as um, right or left. You know, he definitely belongs just as much to the old right as he does to what you'd call the new left. Um, certainly, people today, the people who still are claimants to him, um, are both you know considered left and right. You um, you have the Mises Institute uh, certainly admires him, and you have Center for a Stateless Society, both organizations very anti-state, but different rhetoric, different ethos. Um, but as to what turned him away from politics, that's, uh, that's very interesting, because this is somebody who was close to presidents. This was somebody who was close to some of the top Republicans in the nation. So um, I think one of the things is when he went into this sort of political exile um, after Goldwater's loss is he, he welded and he talked to, um, he talked to you know, your average everyday laborer. Um, and another thing I think, a, a quote that stuck out to me, or a sort of an anecdote that he told is, um, sometime after trying to return to politics in the late 60s, uh, talking with Goldwater about a proposal about abolishing the draft, I believe, uh, Goldwater, who he had admired and respected throughout his life, you know, for sort of having these true libertarian principles, despite the fact that he was a politician, um, I believe Goldwater said, well, we'd have to defer to President Nixon, and that was sort of the last straw for him. I think that's what pushed him over the edge into this anti-political 
sort of mindset. How close were he and Murray Rothbard? Um, I think Murray Rothbard has a lot to do with his political transformation, too. Um, I think that he read anarchist uh, literature at the at the um, sort of the behest of Rothbard, and I think the, the two collaborated a lot. Um, you certainly see a lot of similarities in their in their ideology, and even in their um, even in their rhetoric. Very much, um, especially Rothbard's seventies period. You know, uh, Rothbard wrote for the New Left a little bit too, so he had a bit more of this radical sort of, um, I suppose you'd say, radical ethos. He spoke much more much more to a broad left-wing audience than he did to uh, sort of the LP audience you saw in the 80s and the 90s. Yeah, and, and so, sometimes I read some aspects of the Libertarian Forum, and there are articles in there that, that seem like they could appear in, you know, sort of far, far left-wing publications in a way. That's not the right way to characterize it, but as you say, it's just kind of a, a liberationist, you know, sort of uh, sweeping re revolutionary, radical ap approach right. towards towards virtually every issue. Uh, in fact, wasn't wasn't Carl Hess way ahead on, on the 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 anti cop you know sort of aspect of libertarianism that that's only really relatively recently been rediscovered? Um, I know he definitely would have been a lot more uh, what you'd call resistant to that. He definitely. Um, he was being arrested earlier than other libertarians were, certainly. Um, and he was uh, a tax resistor, too, so he had to deal with these bureaucrats from the IRS on a regular basis, and um, they said, you can't have any money anymore. He, um, he had a 100% lien on him at one point. I think for from about 1968 until uh, the time of his death, he was not legally allowed to hold money. Uh, as far as his dealings with cops, I'm not entirely certain, but I can tell you that <laughs> he couldn't—he couldn't have been a fan. I suppose that he and he and Murray were were kind of close collaborators for oh. probably going on 15 years or something like that. Maybe oh, certainly, certainly during the libertarian form years, I think they would have uh, co-authored co a few things or edited or read. But I think those two um, those two influenced each other in um, a very unique way, in that that they both learned from each other, and they both learned from their time on the left and right. Uh, there's actually a lot of parallel to that because Rothbard started out on the old right isolationist um, sort of, uh, I guess, that grouping, whereas um, that's that's where Hess rose to prominence and rose to power, really, or power in the sense that he was advising these people and. Uh, both ended up um, collaborating with people on the New Left in the late 60s with the student radical movements. Uh, certainly, Hess got a little bit more involved with these radicals in that he was, uh, he considered himself the white member of the Black Panther Party. He, um, he was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World and Students for a Democratic Society, but at the same time, he was collaborating with Robert and um, Leonard Liggio, and he was writing for the New Libertarian Forum. So, he he, of all people, kind of represents this link between left libertarianism and right libertarianism, uh, sort of the sense that it's a union of anti-statism. And, and he, he was a, a, a kind of a, a practicing agorist, too, wasn't he? Uh, didn't he yeah. write a couple of books on, like, I remember his book, Capitalism for Kids, which I, I never read. Have you looked through that book? I actually haven't seen that, but he specifically wrote that for 10-year-olds. Uh, yeah, he was definitely an agorist, though, before... I think Konkin ever termed the coin, uh, coin, coined the term, sorry, agorism. Um, one book in particular that sticks out is um, Community Technology. Um, Hess was this uh, proponent of what you'd call um, appropriate technology. Um, these environmental small-scale energy uh, schemes. And uh, one of the big things he did with this was there was a neighborhood in Washington, D.C., uh, Adams Morgan. He had grown up in D.C. in the area. And he decided that he would want them to be more autonomous. So he tried these experiments with uh, sort of solar power, wind energy, to let them be more independent of you know these large state state collaborating energy cooperatives. And the the results of this experiment are sort of documented in community technology. And I think that's that's important for libertarians to read. It's not just theorizing, you know. Uh, this is the principle by which we live. This is how they were living it at the time. This is how he 
lived his life and how he attempted to incorporate a libertarian lifestyle an environmental lifestyle um, and certainly a healthy lifestyle in, in many ways have you looked through the the lectures that we that we've uh, that we're uploading I've had the pleasure to yeah watch them all uh, they're fantastic I can't recommend them highly enough uh, certainly you see a very clear picture of Hess the man Hess the thinker and Hess the way he lived He seems like a very warm uh, and generous, uh, sort of loving uh, spirit uh, in some ways. He, you know, it's, it's like he thinks that uh, all the principles of liberty really come down to be, being a good friend and a good, and a good neighbor. Uh, uh, I heard him say that a number of times. Uh, yeah, I think that's a quote attributed to him. He, um, it really shines through his sense of humor, his sense of, of humanity, of dignity, of compassion. That's something that stood out to me when I first read and heard about Hess, is that it's not, his libertarianism was not this logical, well, not necessarily entirely this logical or economic efficiency type libertarianism. It was very humanistic, very compassionate, and very much based on, you know, values of love and understanding. And that's, that's appealing, that's refreshing a lot of times, because as much as we need these logical, we need them, we do, and uh, economic or, you know, very rational libertarians. We need that other side. We need that humanistic, that, that friendly face of liberty. The one that says we're going to together as a community. I'm so glad that we've we've recovered these these videotapes because it, it is a little strange when you suddenly you know, uh, run into somebody like Carl Hess and realize just what an epic figure he is, and then you realize how rarely we think about him. You know. Uh, I, I just wonder if maybe the cause of, of what you called his sort of strange obscurity these days <coughs> is that he, he just hasn't had champions, really. He hasn't been an institution to kind of go out and spread his work. It's, uh, the love of Hess is sort of decentralized. The problem with that is that sometimes names can get lost, and we would probably, probably need a Hess Institute and somebody to really pick up his works, of which there are a number, right? And we've got probably five or six or seven or eight books and a ton of lectures and countless articles, too. So there's a real literary legacy here, too. And it's a shame, too, yeah. Like you say, most of these books are out of print. I mean, you can find these back copies on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, but you're not going to find any new copies of these. That's, And it is sad. And I don't, have, I don't have a great answer as to why he's just vanished like this, why nobody picked picked him up because this was a guy who was famous. I mean, he was in an Oscar-winning documentary in, in the 80s. Uh, he was certainly featured in a num num uh, number of other films. He was an interest piece for newspapers at the time because uh, they had seen Barry Gold Goldwater's speechwriter become, um, you know, this radical, long-bearded, long-haired hippie, you know. that's That was shocking to people at the time. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe somebody will watch these these lectures, and uh, sometimes it starts with just a somebody's PhD dissertation, you know, dedicated to him, and then a, a few activists picking up the cause. So, um, you know, the time could could come. I I'd love to see his books put out in in the EPUB format. I suspect there might be some intellectual property issues there. Uh, I I can't say that for sure, but a lot of times this is what happens. So all of his works were published after. Um, you know, copyright is automatically applied to books, and then then he would have, have 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 died. He probably named some literary executor, and there might be a, some confusion about that. It's the only explanation I can come up with. Yeah, hmm. that's a shame. That's a real shame. Uh, my hope is that these videos and um, other releases in his honor uh, sort of renew this interest in him because he's beyond important, really. He's Thank a, you so much for, for doing the research you did. You've written a, a fairly a large article on it. I really enjoyed it. I guess you're going to post that about the same time we post the videos. So mm -hmm. um, maybe we can other people will have stuff uh, better than mine. People who knew knew him better than I, and uh, hopefully everyone reads that and sees that. Well, one one of the things I'd like to see us do actually at Liberty.me is is put out an EPUB version of The End of Politics, the 1960-68 essay that was so seminal, in many ways a founding document of, of, of the sort of post-war liberty movement. So I think that might be a very useful thing to do. I can talk to uh, our curators about that.
I think that's in the pipeline, as far as I know. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. I'm probably just repeating myself. Then it sounds like a staff meeting. Then. <laughs> well, uh, Jackson, it's such a such a pleasure to see you, and thanks for your wonderful work uh, to to help revive the memory of, of Carl Hess and uh, onward and upward. Was uh, uh, I, I like to think that that he's looking down on us and, and cheering on what we're doing. So thank you again for being here today. Thank you. Take care. Carl Hess definitely has faded into obscurity, and it's a very strange thing because he, of all people, especially in the late 60s, early 70s, was just a very public figure in libertarianism and left-wing politics and right-wing politics, which is rare. Um, to give the uninitiated sort of a, an overview of who Carl Hess was... Jackson Stuker, it's a pleasure to have you here. The, the occasion of this call concerns the, the life and legacy of Carl Hess. We recently bumped into five videos of that he of, of of lectures that he gave in his last years of his life. Really, might have been the last year, last years, years later, uh, getting arrested at these student demonstrations that were typical of the the 70s. Uh, he was involved with the Black Panthers. He was a welder, a tax resistor, and this was kind of a shock to the system. So. Um, in a lot of ways, you can describe him as one of the last great American radicals in that he had this, this prominence. He started out in the 50s and 60s, kind of rose to prominence as a, a top advisor and a speechwriter for a lot of the big Republicans like Barry Goldwater. And when Goldwater lost the election uh, for the presidency in 64, he, uh, he kind of put himself into a political exile. And um, so Carl Hess reemerged a couple of years. And in the course of these lectures, he gives a kind of overview of his own worldview. He's a hugely important figure in 20th century uh, libertarianism, really. Uh, just a, a kind of a giant. I have some sense that he's not as well known as, as he, he might be. Um, what's your sense of that, Jackson?